for this Sunday, we're looking at a, not a parable of Jesus, but a riddle of Jesus. Uh, you could call this the riddle of Caesar and the coin. Um, and it's the famous story of the coin that Jesus is presented with, and he's asked whether it is lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not. And then he gives his response. So uh, for the 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time for year A, we're going to be looking at Matthew 22, verse 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and took counsel how to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and that you care for no man. For you do not regard the position of men. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the money for the tax. So they brought him a coin. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. You might notice that that last verse that I just read is not in the lectionary, but again, I include it because it's an important clue for us as to the audience of this particular saying, right? And to how they responded. So Jesus here is once again speaking to the Pharisees, who were very prominent leaders amongst the Jewish people, who were testing him. They were trying to entrap him. They were trying to entangle him, literally, as the text says, in his talk. So what does that mean? This is the context of Jesus' teaching, but what's, what, what's the meaning of the entrapment that they're trying to engage in? Well, in this case, the trap is really simple. They're trying to get him to give a yes or a no answer to the question of whether it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. And the reason that they're doing this is because either way he answers the question, yes or no, can get him in trouble. If Jesus, for example, says yes, it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, he could be accused by his fellow Jews of being a Roman sympathizer. You might recall that there were lots of Jews in the first century AD, especially the Zealots, who were vehemently opposed to the Roman occupation of Jerusalem and to the land of Israel. I mean, they saw the Romans as pagan overlords who had no right to be there. And they also saw, for example, Jewish tax collectors as the virtual equivalent of Gentile sinners, in part because they were colluding with the occupying forces of the Roman Empire. So if Jesus says, oh yes, you have to pay taxes to Caesar, he can be accused of being a Roman sympathizer and fall out with his Jewish, uh, his Jewish contemporaries, his fellow Jews. On the other hand, if Jesus says, no, it's not lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, he could then be accused by the Romans of sedition or of rebellion against the Roman government. So by seeking a yes or no answer, the Pharisees here are trying to get Jesus into trouble, uh, no matter what answer he gives. But as is always the case in the Gospels, you just can't trap Jesus. Don't do it. It's not a good idea because the trap will always spring back in your own face. You're always going to end up being trapped yourself. And in this case, Jesus' response to the Pharisees, his famous response, show me the coin for the tax, is extremely powerful answer to their question. So, but again, we need a little bit of Roman context here. What's going on in this? When Jesus says, show me the denarius for the tax, he's referring to a particular kind of coin. The denarius was a small coin that would be stamped with the profile of the face of the emperor. What's cool about this is that we actually have coins that have survived from the period of Jesus' life. Uh, from around AD 14 to AD 37, the emperor, the Caesar, was named Tiberius. And he produced many of these coins that were stamped with his profile. And on these coins was an inscription. This is really interesting. And you can actually find pictures of this on the internet today, pictures of these coins. The inscription on the coin read, Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. Now think about that for a second. When they hand Jesus the coin, 
it not only has the face, the graven image of the Roman emperor, that alone might have caused some problems with Jews because in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 4, there was a law against any graven images. And yet here is a graven image of the emperor on the coin. But even more, underneath the graven image of Tiberius Caesar, the Roman emperor at the time of Jesus, it not only called him Caesar, it not only called him the emperor, it called him the son of God. Because his father, Augustus, was regarded as divine by the Romans. Uh, you might not realize this, but this is really important. In the first century AD, the two previous emperors, Julius Caesar and Augustus, had both been divinized. They were both elevated to the status of gods by the Roman Empire. Uh, you can see this if you read Suetonius' famous biographies of the emperors. It's called The Lives of the Caesars. When he gets to Julius Caesar and to Augustus, he calls them the life of the deified Julius and the deified Augustus, the divine Julius and the divine Augustus. So in essence, what the coin that they would have handed to Jesus would have had on it was an image of Caesar who was claiming to be the son of God. Now, in that context, think about the political and the theological ramifications of the tax that was being paid to Caesar. And so what Jesus does is something, I mean, I want to say it's brilliant, but because he's the son of God, that sounds a little understated, but it really is. It's really ingenious. He takes the coin with all of that written on it, and he says, well, whose likeness and inscription is on this? And they say, Caesar's. And we know, again, that's true. It would have had the inscription and the profile of Tiberius on the coin. And then he says to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and to God the things that belong to God. Now, most of us recognize here that Jesus is in a very uh, shrewd way giving permission to pay the tax to Caesar. He's saying, look, the money can go to Caesar. It can be paid lawfully to Caesar. And frequently, people will use this as an example uh, for, for teaching and enjoining Christians to be dutiful to the state. In other words, that they need to give to the state what is due to the state, and that they should pay taxes and be contributing members of society. And that is a, a part of what Jesus is getting at. But that's not really the heart of what Jesus is getting at. If you look at it, there's a double meaning here in Jesus' words. Because when he says that the likeness is on the coin and the inscription, the Greek word there is icon. Icon, it means likeness. And we get the, the, the English word icon from this. Okay, So when he says there that the icon of Caesar means that the coin belongs to Caesar, he's allowing for the lawfulness of paying taxes to the emperor. But by taking this image, this language of likeness, Jesus is also alluding to another occurrence of that word in the book of Genesis. You might remember in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 27, God, when he makes man and woman, he says that he made man and woman in the image and the likeness of God. And the Greek translation of the Old Testament there is the same word, icon. So it says that man and woman were made in the icon of God. They're, they are literally icons of of the Creator. They bear the image and the likeness of God. So there's a double meaning here. What Jesus is essentially saying to the Pharisees in response is, you can give your money to Caesar, but you need to give your life, yourself, to God. That's why in that final verse, which the lectionary leaves out, but which I think is very important, you read these words, when they heard it, they marveled and they left him and they went away. In other words, they marveled, they wondered at the truth of what Jesus is saying, and they also marveled at the fact that they couldn't catch him in the trap. His answer was too brilliant. His answer um, was too shrewd.